So the main uh, topic I want to discuss is some new exciting uh, research about CRISPR and DNA repair. But I want to uh, first introduce you know, our biophysics research, single molecule measurements and so on. But before I do that, uh, I also want to talk about life and science, or life or science, life in science, whatever combination that you want, because oftentimes I get asked by students, you know, how I ended up actually going into single molecule biophysics experiments. So I was a college student. I received a scholarship from SK Foundation many years ago. And uh, because of that, I had an American dream. So uh, after finishing college, uh, I went to uh, California for uh, training uh, uh, in PhD. California because it was the closest uh, home, right? And uh, I was young and innocent uh, and, and, uh, and stupid. And actually, most people call me TJ. And the reason is that one day I was watching TV and saw this. So there's uh, O.J. Simpson uh, driving uh, a white Bronco on L.A. highway, fleeing police vehicles after the murder of his wife. And I thought that was brilliant. You know, I should simplify my name to TJ, just like OJ, uh, so it's easier for people to, you know, call me. I was lucky enough to uh, uh, convince a college student to marry me while she was still in college. And uh, soon after, we had our first child uh, here. And uh, believe it or not, uh, she is now a, a PhD student. Uh, studying uh, biology. The same year, I had my second child. So that was my first paper as a scientist. Uh, it turned out that it was a demonstration that you can measure what's called a FRET, or sing, uh, fluorescence resonance energy transfer uh, from uh, single uh, molecules. The idea is pretty uh, straightforward. You, uh, you attach two your biomolecule, let's say protein, uh, that has to uh, change its posture to uh, perform its function, and you attach green and red dye molecules to the protein so that uh, when the distance changes between the two, relative intensities of green and red uh, will change. And actually, we propose that this could be used to measure single molecule uh, conformational changes uh, in the paper without actually believing uh, any of that, but it turned out to be true, so I made a career out of that. So here, uh, uh, if the movie collaborates, uh, I, I demonstrate how it works. Basically, the color that you see from a single protein molecule will change depending on uh, the distance between the two uh, hands here. Yeah, that's the final reaction here, producing uh, hydrogen. Yeah. <laughs> so then we got more ambitious. Uh, we decided to combine a single molecule fluorescence of FRET uh, with another powerful single molecule technology called optical tweezers. So this was a topic of the Physics Nobel Prize last year, uh, where you use a focused laser light to grab a particle and apply very small forces and measure the response uh, mechanically. And by combining the two into a single instrument, we are able to measure how the physical forces uh, can affect uh, molecular dynamics and function. And uh, also many years ago, when I was a, a postdoc, I went to the library uh, trying to find uh, a paper to photocopy. Uh, back then, you had to go to a library, actually. Uh, and use a, f a copy, copying card to do that. But in the same issue, I found a review paper uh, on uh, molecular motor proteins, uh, including uh, what's called uh, a helicase. And helicase is an enzyme uh, that uh, separates two strands of DNA into single strands, important for DNA uh, copying 
and also uh, DNA repair. And as we began to collaborate with uh, Tim Luhmann uh, back then, and we've been working together for many years to unwind the mystery of helicase functions. Actually, Tim got so excited about our collaboration, he changed his uh, uh, car's license plate uh, to uh, uh, unwind uh, one molecule at a time. That's from Missouri. So what are helicases? Uh, they are DNA unwinding uh, enzymes or unzipping enzymes, but if you give them a uh, single-stranded DNA, just one strand of DNA. Uh, they can also move on the DNA as a motor protein, directionally, uh, using ATP as the fuel molecule. And depending on which direction it moves, uh, you can call them you know, one direction or the other. So we have been studying uh, uh, helicases from bacteria. Uh, names are shown there, RAP, and so on. And uh, they are uh, DNA helicases, unwinding DNA, but they are very poor unwinding enzymes. As a single copy, they rarely show any unwinding activity, uh, if any, uh, maybe 10 base pairs at most. There are also two major uh, structural states that you can determine using X-ray diffraction, uh, uh, colloquially called open and closed. And there was a question also, which of the two is a functional form for DNA unwinding activity? Another interesting question is how do you actually make sure that you turn on the activity only when you need that activity, how to regulate that bureaucracy, if you want. So we uh, attach the dye molecules to the protein so that we can distinguish between the two uh, states uh, using uh, FRET, uh, measure proximity between the two dye molecules. And then we put it into an instrument that combines optical tweezers with single molecule FRET you can measure DNA unwinding mechanically using optical tweezers and measure and correlate that with the uh, structural state of the enzyme using a single molecule FRET. And so this is the actual kind of data we get. Basically what we learned from this is that uh, when you have this uh, high uh, proximity state or closed form, uh, enzyme unwinds the DNA moving forward, but then uh, after unwinding maybe 10 base pairs, it changes into the other state uh, structurally and then take takes a U-turn to go back. And this is the reason why it's not a good uh, unwinding enzyme. It just unwinds a little bit, it comes back, unwinds a little bit and comes back and so on. So then we had this idea that using this uh, mechanistic understanding, can we actually uh, uh, staple the enzyme into the closed form permanently using chemical cross-linking? And then you can perhaps make the enzyme super active. So we have done that. Uh, you know, we're gonna call it a rep X because X for cross-linking. Uh, then if you uh, use this uh, optical tweezers instrument to measure unwinding by the enzyme of this DNA, so this DNA, uh, as the enzyme moves to the left on the DNA, uh, unwinding that DNA molecule, the distance between the two beads will go down, and that's exactly what we see. And uh, this distance decrease occurs over uh, many thousand ba base pairs uh, without stopping, uh, even though uh, Without cross-linking, this enzyme is not able to unwind even 10 base pairs. So uh, we were able to uh, uh, st uh, staple the enzyme into the active form that we discovered uh, to create a, a superhelicase. And we're now using this uh, superhelicase for many uh, interesting uh, biotech applications, uh, uh, single molecule DNA sequencing, DNA amplification, and detection of pathogens in low resource setting, and so on. So, uh, so that was the instruction, and I wanted to now uh, move to the uh, main part uh, about uh, CRISPR and DNA repair. So uh, uh, raise your uh, hand if you have heard of CRISPR. Right. Uh, I have, okay. <laughs> okay. So CRISPR-Cas uh, is an... Uh, uh, a system discovered in bacteria, and uh, it's an adaptive immune system. This is what bacteria uses to uh, uh, fight against in infection by uh, viruses. Okay? They keep a memory of the previous infection, and they use it to uh, fight uh, a subsequent uh, infection by the same viruses. But uh, scientists have actually uh, adapted uh, this uh, uh, existing uh, uh, system uh, for genome editing, uh, largely in uh, 
eukaryotic systems like human cells and plants and animals. Uh, and uh, th there's a tremendous amount of uh, research and excitement going on because you could uh, potentially use it for uh, gene therapy uh, to cure uh, rare incurable diseases. And uh, you can also use it for uh, drug development against cancer and infectious disease. You can also use it to uh, create uh, new crops, uh, plants and rice and wheat, uh, and also uh, animals uh, uh, that, uh, uh, that can be used to uh, feed our growing population. So this is the most famous uh, system called uh, Cas9. It's a protein. Uh, discovered uh, this activity was uh, uh, reported uh, in 2012 by the labs at Berkeley and also uh, Lithuania. And uh, this uh, CRISPR protein uh, binds to the DNA, but it carries a guide uh, RNA molecule, and it binds the DNA to unwind the DNA, uh, and then uh, it compares that unwound DNA strand sequence with the sequence on the RNA, and if there's a, in, enough sequence match between the two, then uh, uh, Cas9 protein will cut the DNA on uh, both of the strands of the, on the DNA to create uh, what's called uh, double-stranded double DNA break, or DSB. Then uh, cells uh, use the existing DNA repair mechanisms to uh, repair the DNA, sometimes with errors, sometimes faithfully, and you can use either of the two mechanisms to uh, cause uh, changes into the genome uh, as you desire. So once Cas9 makes a break in the DNA at a site that you desire, then uh, uh, it can be repaired in a manner that is error-prone. Uh, you can insert, delete a DNA, and basically you use it to disrupt the gene's function. Or you can uh, use uh, what's called uh, homology di directory repair using a provided template to uh, precisely edit uh, or insert uh, uh, gene uh, functions to uh, the, the, the genome. So here's uh, a little uh, animation that I took from uh, Broad Institute. Once inside the nucleus, the resulting complex will lock onto a short sequence known as the PAN. The Cas9 will unzip the DNA and match it to its target RNA. If the match is complete, the Cas9 will use two tiny molecular scissors to cut the DNA. When this happens, the cell tries to repair the cut, but the repair process is error-prone, leading to mutations that can disable the gene, allowing researchers to understand its function. So that is uh, you know, how it kind of works. And, uh, but uh, there are actually uh, still a lot of uh, technical issues uh, uh, in terms of uh, safety. Uh, for example, instead of cutting uh, where you want, it can cut at many other sites on the genome. And that's largely because the system evolved in bacteria that has about a thousand times smaller genome. And, but if you try to use it in human cells, uh, you get actually uh, what's called the off-target uh, effect. There are also other uh, side effects. You can cut the right location, but then the, the way cells repair the break can cause uh, additional uh, uh, defects to the cell or an organism, and that uh, can even uh, uh, cause uh, potential cancer. So uh, we uh, tried to uh, study how, uh, uh, how Cas9 actually uh, uh, is able to confirm uh, the correct uh, target DNA sequence. And because uh, Cas9 uh, binds uh, and unwinds the DNA and, uh, and comparing it to uh, uh, guide RNA, uh, shown in this uh, animation, and if the matching is good enough, uh, it'll cut uh, the DNA, we thought we should actually use a single molecule FRET or SM FRET to measure DNA unwinding so by putting dyes on, on the DNA shown so that unwinding will give you a reduction in uh, proximity. And uh, that's actually uh, what's shown here. Uh, this is the only real uh, uh, actual data that I will show you today. So here, uh, uh, you're measuring uh, basically uh, proximity between the two dye molecules. And uh, when you have a fully matching DNA sequence, that proximity is, is low because uh, you have unwound uh, 
the DNA duplex, uh, so that is uh, far away from each other. But as you insert uh, more and more uh, mismatches on the DNA, one, two, three, four mis mismatches, eventually Cas9 decides that it's not a good enough match and rejects the DNA. Okay? Uh, when does it reject the DNA? Actually, it turns out it uh, be begins to reject the DNA when you have uh, three or four base pair mismatches. So in a sense, the Cas9 protein that we found in nature is not so uh, selective. It's, it's not very choosy, right? It's uh, promiscuous. So there are uh, 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 a couple of really interesting papers uh, three years ago uh, where people engineered a Cas9 protein and found that in cell experiments that uh, genome editing was much more specific. Uh, so these are called enhanced Cas9s or Cas9 with high fidelity. And it turns out that in our DNA unwinding experiments, you know, we can also show that uh, these enhanced proteins are a lot choosier. Okay? They can actually say no to even uh, small uh, uh, mismatches. So this is the kind of work that we've been doing uh, in, in trying to understand how uh, to improve the Cas9 and find the correct target sequence. And uh, we actually continue the, uh, this kind of work also with, uh, in, in, in collaboration with a company in uh, South Korea. Oh, oh so, so uh, by the way, uh, last year I uh, asked um, an artist uh, uh, in Baltimore, Maryland, uh, to uh, create a song to explain uh, how we do our research. So here's a song, uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to play a little video. So you'll find some of the words I uh, mentioned in the lyric. Yeah, SM Fred, please do not forget Single molecules and dyes the colors green and red Yeah, SM Fred, you will not regret Use Cas9 to cut like it's Gillette with CRISPR tech Ay, In this lab we doing work with fluorescence Study enzyme kinetics, sequence the genus phonetic Yeah, ATC and G's, we like to play with beams Cas9 unwinds the genes, and then it cuts the seams Turf makes evanescent feels, shows the star fluorescent seals We record the videos like we got adolescent feels Getting attracted, getting repelled, measuring habits, what does it spell? Molecular structure, molecular chatting, and everything down to molecular wrapping Optical trap, yeah, pull on the strap, Hey. yeah Optical trap, yeah, move on the map Hey, yeah, you cannot use fret with it. The fluorophores photo bleach out of it. Get ready to laser it. You measure by moving the stage a bit. You look at its elements. You pull and you look at the range of it. You pull and you look at the strength of it. You pull and you start rearranging it. Time to talk about single molecule imaging. Go faster. Naturally, this imaging will come with its limiting factors. You focus on part of the slides. Not that the others don't matter. Super S will come select and light molecules up at random. Aye. SM. Please do not forget, don't forget single molecules and dyes the colors yeah. green and red. Yeah. Yeah. SM Fred, you will not regret. Use Cas9 to cut like yeah. it's Gillette with crystal yeah. tabs. Yeah. Hey, 5,000, base pairs without stopping. Splits your defense like it's Kyrie when it's walking. Here at TEDx, rep and rep X, cause it's new tech. Our healer case and wants to duplex. We use Fred. But what's Fred? The donors and acceptors. He splits the channel like he's splitting into sectors. The closer the dyes, the higher the fret. The further they go, the lower the red. The green is the donor, the red is the acceptor. We read the data like reading the letters. Uh, yeah. Like reading the letters. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, the, uh, science is a family business, uh, <laughs> and, and it's, uh, it's on the YouTube, so you can, uh, you can look, look for it. So um, then uh, we got inspired, uh, you know, how do we make uh, CRISPR-Cas9 better? Uh, how, how do you make it safer? So we thought uh, we, sh we could try to uh, control CRISPR activity in space and time. So we have great precision in controlling the activity in the, in the genomic coordinate. You know, we can find one location, ideally, out of three billion base pairs. 
but uh, so far, our control over the space and time has been very, very uh, uh, limited. Uh, uh, so imagine uh, having a, a, a robot that uh, sits uh, on the target DNA, but waiting for your instruction quietly. And then you send your instruction uh, using uh, uh, light, and then it'll cut the DNA right there, right on the spot, right at the moment. That can be great uh, for uh, many different applications. And you can use it to study how the cells repair uh, DNA damage. So that is uh, the goal, to expand uh, the CRISPR control to, uh, into uh, space and time uh, in addition to genomic coordinates. So I don't uh, think I'm, I can really, uh, have time to explain how it works, but uh, just take my words for it. Uh, basically, we found a, a trick uh, to allow the Cas9 protein bind the target DNA, but not cut the DNA until you shine light and then it cuts the DNA within a few seconds. Okay? So that's sexual control uh, over time that is much, much uh, faster than ever before because previous best was about an hour or two. As we call it, very fast CRISPR on demand. So the idea is that you, uh, you let them uh, sit on the DNA, you know, ready to go, right, lining up, and you wait for uh, the race gun to fire, and then they, they go. So what can you do if you have that? Like imagine having a cluster of cells, as in a human embryo, uh, shown here. Each cell uh, would have two copies of the same gene, one from your mom, uh, the other from your dad. Right? And I, I'm, yeah, I'm coloring them in green. And then uh, you can, because you, your light can be focused to a small spot, you can actually uh, shine light onto only one of those many cells and then create cuts at the two, of the, uh, two copies of the gene. And then we can actually uh, visualize uh, the process uh, by actually using a uh, red uh, fluorescent protein uh, linked to a uh, DNA repair protein that uh, gathers up uh, around there to, uh, you know, to start the DNA repair. So that is our signature of DNA cleavage on demand. So here's an actual example. Uh, so I have uh, three uh, human cells, and each contains two uh, copies of the uh, green spots, uh, uh, maybe, and uh, this is at the beginning, uh, before shining light, and then 20 minutes later, uh, because we shine, uh, we illuminated only this cell, this cell collects uh, a red dust, so these two uh, spots become yellow, and 40 minutes later, they become uh, red as they collect more and more uh, uh, DNA repair protein. Whereas uh, two other cells that didn't get the light illumination uh, stay uh, green. Okay. So let me actually run the movie here. So you can actually watch this one, uh, which will be uh, illuminated for 10 seconds. And as time goes on, uh, because DNA has been already cut, now they accumulate uh, DNA repair protein, showing that they are indeed cut. But if you look at other uh, cells, uh, they do not show uh, DNA repair protein accumulation because now we have achieved uh, the control at the single cell resolution. So this is really exciting. We can even do better. We can, because you can uh, focus laser light even to a smaller spot, right? You can eliminate only one of the two spots, you know, let's say, uh, only uh, the uh, DNA from your mom, not from your dad. So here is an example. Uh, so uh, we will illuminate uh, just this one, not the other one. And then that one, uh, you know, with the light, will c uh, collect the red, but not the other one. Actually, this was uh, quite tough, so it took about two months to get it to work. So when my postdoc got it to work, he took a video using his iPhone, uh, sent it to me. So the video is actually very shaky, so, uh, but it's fun because it's the first movie. So I suggest that if you close your eyes if you are uh, 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 prone to uh, motion sickness. Okay, so that's the movie. Voila, now you can actually uh, 
actually activate a CRISPR uh, only one copy of the two genes uh, in the same cell. Okay. So we can achieve the single allele resolution. We can also uh, turn off uh, CRISPR-Cas9 activity with light. Uh, it's a slightly different trick. So, uh, for example, uh, normally uh, when CRISPR-Cas9 is active, it'll uh, cut the gene uh, making a green fluorescence protein. So cells uh, remain dark. But if you create a, a photo mask uh, so that you shine light through the white, uh, actually transparent areas uh, formed in this complex pattern, then uh, then, uh, then in, the, in, in the transparent area, uh, CRISPR-Cas9 is inactivated with by light, and therefore a green fluorescence protein is produced, and you see a green uh, signal. So now we, we have both the method to turn on the activity with light on demand very rapidly, and also turn off the activity on demand. So imagine genome editing exactly. When, where we want it you know, in space, and also when we want. So I would call that a, a 5D CRISPR, because 1D for CRISPR genomic coordinate, 3D for space, and 1D for time. And I think it will be really exciting to pursue this uh, direction, uh, a new level of control of uh, genom genomic uh, manipulation. And, you know, immediate applications are, you know, high efficiency editing, uh, uh, essentially with, with no off-target effects because you're shining light only on one of the two uh, loci, a subcellular level, uh, that uh, you can uh, uh, edit just the allele that is defective. And, uh, and this is a wonderful tool to study the basic cell biology of how cells uh, repair uh, DNA by creating a synchronized uh, uh, cleavage across a cell population. So people who did the work are shown uh, here on the left side. Uh, my uh, heroes, uh, Yang Liu, Raja Zhou, Dick Vijay Singh, Binu, and, and so on. And uh, uh, when, when you're not working, we go to the Chesapeake, Chesapeake, Chesapeake Bay, uh, you know, near the Washington DC area. We do fishing, and you can see that we are quite accomplished uh, fishermen on, on that day. Thank you so much.